With the cost of DDR memory soaring, thanks to AI data centers swallowing up every bit of stock, it's even harder to justify building a system in this day and age. And because of that, we recently looked at the AM5 platform in the 9000 series to see if there was a glimmer of hope when it comes to buying single channel memory over a dual channel kit. Well, following on from that, we wanted to see what that means for Intel and the 14th generation of processors, meaning that if you're looking to build a system with a 14600K, 14700K or 14900K and are able on the off chance to get hold of a single large capacity stick, are you actually leaving a lot of performance on the table? Or is having a system with one stick better than essentially having well, no system at all? So today we're putting it to the test. But as always, before we get into that, here's a quick word from this video sponsor. Doc, you gotta help me. I, I can't land a single shot. 1080p, 30 hertz. Andy, I'm afraid you're suffering from a severe case of suboptimal hardware. What? What you need is the Philips Evnia 27M2 N8500. 1440p, 360 hertz, display HDR true black 400, lightning fast 0.03 millisecond response time, and a true 10-bit QD OLED display. You'll be popping headshots in no time. It's, it's beautiful. Oh, let's see how I do. This might be terminal. Next level gaming with Philips Evnia, skill not included. Find out more by clicking the link in the description below. So a quick recap on what's actually going on. For anyone out of the loop, AI is literally taking over and due to the requirements, memory in the desktop retail world is in super short supply. And due to that, prices have gone, well, to the moon and don't look to be moving back down anytime soon. And this kind of got us thinking about what you as a consumer would be able to do if you're dead set on building a gaming system. And the big thing that I guess stuck out to us is dual channel memory versus, well, single channel memory. If you're looking to build a PC, you no longer have that luxury of being able to choose, at least to a degree, and you may just have to settle. With that in mind, it does allow you to, I guess, broaden your search a little, as instead of buying a dual channel kit, you potentially have the ability to search for single sticks, which on the likes of eBay and Facebook Marketplace, you may get lucky with someone splitting a kit or breaking down a workstation who maybe is unaware of the current, calling it what it is, crisis. So what we've done is taken a single 32 gig stick of 6,000 megahertz CL40 DDR5 and put it up against a dual channel kit of two 16 gig sticks running at the exact same speed and timings. Much like we did for the Ryzen 9000 series, we wanted to see if dual channel is still the way to go or if you could, I guess, make do with a single stick that could potentially be upgraded at a later date. In theory, giving you, I guess, an even larger capacity at some point down the line when prices start to stabilize whenever that may be. Now what we've done is looked at the Core i5 14600K, i7 14700K and i9 14900K at 1080p where memory constraints typically show their ugly head to see how much if any the difference is between both scenarios. To test we put these chips and memory into the ASUS ROG Z790 Maximus Extreme with an RTX 5090 Founders Edition to rid of any GPU bottleneck. For the memory, we used a single stick of A-Pacer Nox 32 gig 6000 megahertz CL40 memory for our single channel tests and an XPG Lancer Blade 32 gigabyte dual channel kit for our other tests. As the timings are different between the kits, we normalize the timings and sub timings to be the same for both scenarios to give a fair test. I will also say that while low settings will show a higher variance, we tested on higher settings as these are where I guess the majority of the user base will be playing settings wise anyway. So it's more of a truer representation of what the average gamer will actually see. So with that out of the way, let's get into those glorious benchmarks. Starting things off with Counter-Strike 2 on medium settings, which is where anyone serious about CS2 will be aiming to play at in terms of the preset. And here we find the 14700K and 14600K not actually seeing a huge amount of difference when moving from single channel to dual channel memory, with just a 1% and 2% uplift, which I guess can be contributed to margin of error anyway. That aside, the 1% lows saw a bigger difference on the 14700K of 5%, while the 14600K only saw a 3% difference. 
The i9 14900K though did see a bigger difference of 6% in both the averages and the 1% lows, which is just above margin of error, but at over 350 FPS, it's negligible with you know what you'd see on the screen anyway. Moving over to Cyberpunk on the Ultra preset, and the uplift does increase compared to what we just saw in CS2. On the 14600K, we find a 12% uplift in the averages and a 17% increase in the lows when moving to dual channel memory, which is a pretty significant increase, especially compared to the 14700K, which only saw a 9% increase in the averages and 13% in the lows. Though it's still something, but obviously comes down to the cost difference at the point of actually buying the memory. Then the 14900K sees a 13% increase in frames compared to single channel and a healthy 17% increase in the lows, much like we saw on the 14600K. In Spider-Man 2, the 14600K comes in with a 19% uplift in the averages and a similarly impressive 20% increase in the 1% lows, while the 14700K improves on that with a 21% uplift in the averages and 22% increase in the 1% lows. But the crown for variance really comes down to the 14900K, with 26% faster performance in the averages and 31% more frames in the 1% lows. This shows that certain games handle performance differently, but depending on your exact setup and mainly GPU, this could actually equate to taking an unplayable game into a playable state. Then in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we find our dual channel setup besting the single channel on the 14600K setup by 13% in the averages and 17% in the 1% lows, while the 14700K comes in similar, seeing a 12% uplift in the averages and 18% more frames in the lows. But the more interesting result here is again on the 14900K, which does see a similar 13% increase in frames in the averages, but smooths things out dramatically in the lows to the tune of 33%. Though this is more through the fault of the CPU in single channel mode getting quite a low result and retesting did garner a similar result and the best of three was taken. Lastly, in the Rift Breaker, we find the 14600K packing another 17% more performance in the averages and 27% more in the lows when comparing single channel to dual channel, while the 14700K sees a slightly lesser jump of 14% in the averages and 22% in the lows. The i9-14900K sees the biggest jump here with 25% faster performance in the averages and 26% in the lows, which looks very impressive on an RTX 5090, but as you scale it down, that again could actually make the game to a higher state in terms of playability that just wasn't there before if utilising a lower end GPU. Of course, to get a clearer idea as to what this means across a variety of games, because the average gamer is more than likely going to play more than one game on their system, unless of course you're a hardcore gamer who only plays one game, like we see a lot with CS2 players, we have to look at the overall averages. What we find here is on the 14600K, the dual channel setup does give us a 10% increase in performance when looking at the averages and a 14% uplift in the 1% lows. When we move up to the i7-14700K, the average is very similar with a 9% increase, while the lows show a 14% increase. Again then, as expected, the 14900K shows the biggest performance jump of 14% in the averages and 20% in the lows when moving from single channel to the dual channel setup. So what does this all tell us about the current state of Intel's 14th gen when you're forced into a single channel compromise? Is it a compromise or does it offer up something to at least get you up and running and playing your favorite games? Well, if you remember our look at the Ryzen 9000 series, there was a clear, let's call it safety net for gamers in the form of the 9800X3D or any X3D part for that matter. Its massive cache acted a bit like a buffer, making the single channel penalty almost disappear in some titles. On the Intel side, however, there is well, no such hide in place. Because Intel's architecture relies so heavily on raw frequency and high core counts to push frames, that memory bandwidth becomes the bottleneck much, much sooner than what it did on AMD. Well, at least on the X3D parts. Looking at the overall picture, the 14900K is, I guess, the clear loser when it comes to single channel efficiency. Much like the Ryzen 9950X, when you have that many cores and threads screaming for data, cutting the memory bandwidth in half in gaming essentially gives it a hard ceiling. A 20% hit to the 1% lows across the board is a massive price to pay for a CPU of this caliber, as it effectively turns your flagship i9 into an i5 in terms of smoothness. In fact, under single channel on the 14900K, the 14600K did better in the averages and 1% lows when it had two sticks of memory. Now, speaking of that chip, along with the 14700K, they both sit in a similar boat to the Ryzen 9700X. They're more resilient than the i9, but they still feel the sting. 
especially in games like Spider-Man 2 and the Rift Breaker, where the 1% lows saw jumps of over 20% just by adding that second stick. It also confirms that any form of sluggishness isn't just a placebo or a quirk with Windows or your game. It's the physical reality of the CPU stalling while it waits for that memory bus to clear its queue. So where does that leave you? Well, if you're building on Intel's 14th gen, which is still relatively popular, especially compared to the Core Ultra series, which has seen the hype around it, well, dwindle, the conclusion is actually a bit more rigid than it was when we did these tests on the AMD 9000 series. Without a 3DV cache equivalent to save you, running single channel memory on a high-end Intel rig is leaving a significant chunk of the performance you paid for on the table. While a single 32 gig stick is a viable get it up and running strategy, if you find a desperate seller on eBay, you should view it as a strictly temporary solution. On AMD, you could potentially live with a single stick on an X3D chip for a year and well, barely notice. On Intel, that itch to buy the second stick is going to start the moment you see those 1% lows dipping in a heavy AAA title. It's the difference between a system that works and a system that actually feels like the high-end machine that you spent your hard-earned cash on. Ultimately, the rule for 2025 and beyond remains the same. Dual channel is the goal. But if the memory market forces your hand, Intel will fill the pain more than AMD's, let's call them specialized gaming chips. If you're going the single stick route to save your budget, just make sure that the second slot doesn't stay empty for too long. Or as we've shown here, go with AMD instead. But make sure it's an X3D chip of some kind. If you are dead set on Intel though, it's clear to see that the i7-14700K has seen the lesser hit out of the chips that we tested. And if you're looking at just gaming, even before this, I'd recommend that over the i9 anyway, as in terms of value for money, it's always been the better choice. So there we have it. We've now done this for AMD's 9000 series and Intel's 14th gen. So let me know in the comments section if you want to see this for any other generation as AMD's 7000 series and 5000 series are still popular along with Intel all the way back to 12th gen. And obviously some of this opens things up for DDR4, which could be, I guess, a bit of a cost saving in itself too. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. If you did, a like and a sub to the channel would be amazing. And if you love what we do, you can help support us over on Patreon. You'll get a ton of cool extras, including exclusive behind the scenes content, access to a lot of our testing data and much more. The link is as always down below. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you in the next one. See you later, guys. Bye-bye.